So welcome to the revision video for IGCC Physics. This is just one whole topic. There are some more videos which are individual subsections, but this is for if you finish the entire topic. So there are eight videos in the series. If you like and enjoy, please subscribe. Okay, so this is uh, an introductory topic video for IGCC Physics, 8B Astrophysics on Orbits. So key maths, the relationship between orbital speed, um, radius and time period is V, is distance travelled over time taken, or orbit. So that would work out for a circle, of course, 2 pi r, or pi times d, so that's your circumference. And obviously it takes you an amount of time to get around that circle. So it's 2 pi r over t being the time period. Now to work out V, of course, it depends on what r and t are for units. So time could be in hours, seconds, minutes. Distance could be kilometers or meters. So you've got to be able to convert hours into seconds or days. So 24 hours is that many, 86,400 seconds, kilometers into meters. And so you've got to be flexible on your units. That's the tricky bit. The, the equation's always the same. We also should know about something called an astronomical unit. They'll often give you a bit of information on this, but the clever part is as an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the sun. So if we think about relative speaking, Mars is further away, so it's 1.52 astronomical units, or 1.52 times 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. Clearly the reason is, it's a lot easier to deal in AUs than it is in lots and lots of meters. We should know what an eclipse is, so it's basically if things are orbiting, so you've got the sun coming in this way from the left, and when the Earth and the Moon are aligned like this, and the Moon's behind the Earth, we get a shadow. It's just the absence of light, so part it could be partial, it could be full. So in the case of the moon, we get an eclipse here, but people can still see stuff here. So it's just being able to talk about eclipses. Um, gravity then, a bit of massy stuff. So the gravitational field strength, it's important you call it grav field strength, GFS. G is different under the planets and the moon from that on Earth, whereas G is 10 newtons of pull for every kilogram of matter or 10 meters per second squared or 10 ms slash s to the 2 or m slash s slash s. That would be on Earth, on other planets is different because they are clearly different sizes, different masses, different radii, that kind of thing. So the gravitational um, field strength creates a force which causes moons to orbit planets, it pulls things together, and we use the formula weight is mg, or f is ma, they're basically the same equation. Now, things in the universe, I see no end of people making a mess of it. It's simple, you've got to learn, universe contains everything we know of. The galaxies are collections of stars and matter. The stars are just hot balls of gas fusing. There's one. It's called the sun, but it's actually a star. Solar systems have a star in the middle. There could be a solar system. We've got planets and dwarf planets. They orbit the star. Dwarf planets are very small planets that are not really big enough to be called a planet, and their gravity is pretty weak, so we call them a dwarf planet. Moons, they orbit the planets. Comets, they have these usually elliptical orbits that go around the suns or the stars that come around every so often and we see them and they look cool um, and they're made of rock and ice. Um, asteroid, just a lump of rock floating in space. We have an asteroid belt further out in, in our solar system. Um, if, it, if you hit stuff like meteorites or asteroids, it's not good. But a meteorite is just an asteroid that falls to the atmosphere of a planet, burns up often as it, as it, as it arrives. Satellite then in a stable orbit moving at a constant speed in a circular orbit at a particular distance from the object it's orbiting would be a satellite. But if we remember that vectors such as velocity have magnitude at size and directions, it has a change in velocity. So because the direction changes, we say it has a change in velocity, even though it's traveling at a steady speed. You've got to try to recognize these types of pictures to label satellites, planets, comets, and suns. Again, it's simple if you learn it. So there you go, 8B astrophysics. Okay, so this is an IGCC introductory video about 8C stellar evolution. So really it's about how stars evolve and what happens in stars. So let's start with the middle. The simple idea really of stars are fusion machines. They build most of the atoms we find, the vast majority that is, in the universe today as they release radiation, so like electromagnetic spectrum stuff and particles. Smaller elements such as helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, are formed in main sequence stars. So they're stars about the same size as our sun or a bit bigger, and they're in a sort of early part of their life. And so things like helium and beryllium fuse together to form carbon, which is a bigger atom. And then obviously those atoms eventually are released into the universe and they do things like build our bodies. 
oxygen, two oxygens could be pushed together to make silicon plus two hydrogens. And those hydrogens would go on to do fusion again. Now, larger elements such as iron, uranium and such like are, are made in much larger stars where the fusion forces are increased. So stars are basically our atom generators. Now, evolution of stars then. So there's different pathways really, depending on their original size. So they all start off as a cloud of gas, hydrogen, dust, bits and pieces called a nebula. We then form a baby star called a protostar where the fusion just starts to kind of come together, switch on, gets hotter. And eventually we've got this glowy main sequence star that looks very much like our star now. Now, here's the big difference. If the star is about the same size as the sun, it eventually becomes a red giant, getting bigger and bigger. In our case, it would then burn everything off our planet, we'd all be dead, and then it would slowly form a white dwarf and eventually a black dwarf and cool down. Now, if though you are bigger, so stars that are between three and 10 times um, the size of our star, eventually become a neutron star. And if you're 10 and above 10 times, um, you would become a black hole. But in between that, you would have a red supergiant, which is like, like ours, but much, much bigger. Supernova, which means they literally explode. And that's where you form all these different elements like iron, uranium and stuff. And um, then you end up with a pathway of really big ones go black hole and they suck stuff in and integrate matter into energy. Or you just get a neutron star, which is really weird because it's just made of neutrons. So a cupful of a neutron star would weigh the same as the entirety of our planet. Crazy stuff. Hertzsprung Russell diagrams. Now, these are really quite cool. So, now to understand that, you've got to understand about that the surface temperature difference and color differences and luminosity differences in stars. And what you've got to learn effectively is this diagram. Now, weirdly, it's got a decreasing temperature surface going outwards and an increasing luminosity. And what we find is that when we have these supergiant or red giants or main sequence or white dwarfs, they form a certain pattern which is kind of cool. You've just got to learn it and be able to sketch it out. The last thing here, it's a tricky one for triple students, is the brightness of a star at a standard distance can be represented using absolute magnitude. So there's this weird scale where actually when you go up in numbers, you're fainter. And if you go down in numbers in a negative, get more and more negative, you are brighter. Absolute magnitude M depends on the luminosity or the brightness of the star. And it's this reverse scale, as we said, and it's an odd system started by the Greeks and it has lots of complex maths that we don't need for GCC, you do it later. And what we do is analyze or compare a star as if it was a standard distance from the Earth. So at 32.6 light years away or 10 parsecs, or it could be three times 10 to 17 meters away. So we put them at a standard distance and decide whether they're brighter or fainter than a reference point. A little bit weird, it's only worth a couple of marks though. There you go, that's stellar evolution. So this is the very last topic in the IGCC intro um, units. So this is 8D cosmology key points. So let's talk about the different cards. So we've got cosmic microwave background radiation, or just CMB often called. Um, that's a simple idea that when the universe was created, matter and antimatter, so it might be ant antiprotons and protons, um, came together. They annihilated. So when particles, antiparticles come together, they annihilate. They produce energy, um, but in the form of a wave. So the gamma rays are produced, and the energy there is a very short wavelength. That radiation is very short. But of course, if the universe is getting bigger and bigger, so expanding, it got longer too over time. So now those gamma waves appear as microwaves, and we actually pick them up as crackles, hiss, and interference on our radios. Now, two scientists called Penzias and Wilson. Sometimes they talk about them. They found that the, these waves by using something called the horn antenna. It's like a special microwave telescope, and it was all by accident. But um, it's pretty impressive because they have got evidence that prove um, partly that the Big Bang happened. So it's an expansion of the universe was proved by cosmic microwave background radiation. The other bit of big evidence that we've got to talk about is redshift. Now, redshift is when light of a specific wavelength is emitted from a distant galaxy and it becomes stretched because the universe is expanding. So a blue wave is emitted from a star and then when it gets to Earth, it appears a little bit more red. Now, that's what we call a spectral shift. It's a little bit simplistic that because what we really mean is, is that say if light emitted from a star that contained calcium, hydrogen, iron or magnesium gave out these special spectral missing lines, 
what we're saying is is that this one will be shifted just slightly over so this one's green and it would still be green that's red and is still red this one is so like blue but might appear green or green appears red so we're shifting our wavelengths effectively and that shift tells us that not only if we look at these spectral lines it tells you what the star contains but if the reference pattern is shifted to the right it tells us how far it's moving away from us um, and the special formulas for that is that when a wave source is moving relative to an observer there'll be a change in observed frequency and wavelength so we've got the change in a wavelength divided by the reference wavelength which would be lambda naught so that's the change divided by the original wave so that's what's emitted that's the, the shift effectively divided by the speed it's traveling at over the speed of light simple as that so it looks tricky it's very straightforward when you do some questions so that's a massive bit to prove this redshift or doppler shift um and the big bang is really this theory that the whole of the universe began at a single point called a singularity um which was incredibly high energy 13.8 billion years ago then we had a rapid expansion which occurred um from which all of the matter in the universe formed the universe is very hot, around 4,000 degrees Kelvin, or 4,000 Kelvin, I should say, which has been cooling as it expands, and now the temperature is around 2.7 Kelvin. So we've cooled down massively. We've got these microwaves now that we're gamma, and we've got redshift, all proving that this Big Bang happened and the universe expanded. What you've got to be able to specifically do is work out redshift for galaxies. And so galaxies that move apart from each other, so as the Earth, and we're part of the Milky Way, and we're in a local group, and these local groups move away from each other, and also galaxies move away from each other. So we see redshifted light in general from galaxies, because the tricky bit is you can do, um, in other specs, you look at where um, sometimes stars can come towards you, but we're just looking at when they go away, which is redshift. So there you go. That is Cosmology 8D done.